nice introduction. Uh, <laughs> although I do think you go overboard, but uh, I'll take whatever it is. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I understand that you know the good thing about you know uh, uh, dealing with Chagra contents and talking to Chagra contents uh, is what I tell everyone, right? I don't have to start from scratch. Uh, so I'm hoping that you know uh, there'll be a lot of participation in the course of this particular discussion. So I mean, the more you ask me questions and the more we want to talk about issues. Uh, one good thing is that, you know, I'll have to talk less. Uh, so that way, you know, mine won't be the only voice uh, I would want to hear during the course of this particular discussion. So the more the questions, uh, the more the welcome. Right. Uh, so um, when I was talking to Bharat and Sandeep, you know, uh, both of them suggested that, you know, uh, the, uh, that I also discuss whatever are the relevant issues in relation to this particular topic both that pertaining to, you know, the liberalized remittance scheme, as well as, you know, the deposit regulations under FEMA. So what I would suggest, and uh, I hope this approach is okay, is that although I know that, you know, many of you or most of you or all of you would have anyway dealt with these particular issues, especially points pertaining to liberalized remittance scheme, you know, for the benefit of the uh, entire group as such, uh, with your permission, you know, I would anyway want to go through uh, the broad norms under the liberalized remittance scheme uh, before we do a slightly more deeper dive uh, into uh, what are the specific issues or ambiguities which I think are prevalent in these kind of regulations, right? And if you think that, you know, okay, I mean, we don't have to agree on all aspects. That's the beauty of Emma, uh, because there are a lot of gray areas, there are a lot of ambiguities. Uh, if you think you have a different view or obviously, you know, if you have any kind of queries or any other issues which uh, I may or may not be aware of, or if you think that, you know, I should be covering uh, certain other issues, uh, please feel free to uh, let me know. I'm more than happy to, you know, uh, look into those issues and uh, discuss those issues as well. Uh, so as I said, uh, the two uh, uh, slightly different topics which I seek to cover as part of this, uh, you know, study group meet. The first one is obviously the liberalized remittance scheme. Uh, so as a, as most of you or all of you are anywhere very well aware, you know, the liberalized remittance scheme uh, is a fairly straightforward uh, set of uh, norms which has been put forth by the RBI in consultation with the government of India. Uh, the idea being the liberalized remittance scheme was that, you know, uh, there is a need for uh, Indian individuals or residents in India to also undertake any kind of overseas transactions. So that's the reason why uh, the liberalized remittance scheme came into play uh, to put forth a simplified set of norms uh, for outward remittances by individuals. Um, so when the norm came about, I think it was in 2004 or 2005, uh, the initial limit was uh, $25,000 per calendar year. Over a period of change, uh, over a period of time, you know, the, uh, the nature of the scheme has uh, undergone significant changes. More importantly, the kind of remittances uh, which can be undertaken under the liberalized remittance scheme has also drastically gone up by, you know, literally by 10x. Uh, when we started off, it was $25,000 per calendar year. Now it's come to, you know, $250,000 per financial year. Financial year obviously reckoned from um, April to March basis. Um, so why is there a liberalized remittance scheme? Obviously, you know, as I said, there is a, a business need. Uh, there is a diversification need. Uh, and obviously, you know, a whole lot of, you know, issues relating to asset ownership, uh, family uh, related matters, etc., for which foreign exchange remittances are required. So in addition to whatever has been prescribed under the uh, current account transaction rules under FEMA, uh, the RBI and the government of India also thought it to be prudent to you, to you also, you know, to have a dedicated scheme uh, specifically uh, covering these kind of remittances. These kind of remittances, the current account uh, transaction rules are obviously, you know, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're applicable to individuals, they're applicable to companies or any other person who's trying to make remittance outside India. Whereas a liberalized remittance scheme is a more uh, focused, dedicated, and most of the time also a simplified scheme, which is available only to resident individuals. It's not available for non-residents. Uh, it's not available for partnerships, HUFs, or any kind of trust. Uh, so this is the broad uh, uh, policy-related uh, approach for having the liberalized remittance scheme. Um, so now what has happened is that, you know, with effect for the last four or five years, you know, the liberalized remittance scheme and the current account transaction rules and the FEMA, both of them were coexistent, coexisting at the same time, right? So now what the RBI has done is that, you know, instead of, you know, um, trying to crunch the matters or trying to come up with one scheme, what they said, what they've said is something very simple. They've said that, look, even when individuals are undertaking any kind of current account transactions, that will get subsumed within the uh, liberalized remittance scheme limit. So 
it doesn't matter uh, whether you're undertaking any kind of transaction which is provided under the LRS regulations or any kind of transactions as individuals which you are undertaking under the current account transaction rules. Now, overall, you'll be subject to the limit of $250,000. So that, that way, you know, there's an ease of um, uh, supervision, there's an ease of reporting, and, you know, it, it also puts things in one big basket of $250,000. So what the LRS permits you to do, the LRS permits you to do undertake all capital and current account transactions, which are permissible under FEMA. Uh, the reason why I'm emphasizing, uh, emphasizing on permitted capital and current account transactions is very simple and straightforward is that, you know, you can't, if something is not permissible in other regulations under FEMA, whether it be any other kind of capital account transaction regulations under FEMA or any other kind of current account transaction regulations under FEMA, you cannot do so under the LRS unless it's been specifically provided for even under the LRS, right? So any kind of actions which are otherwise not permitted under FEMA, uh, any other kind of transactions which are not uh, permitted uh, uh, under FEMA, uh, that is something which you cannot undertake under LRS. For instance, the current account transaction rules uh, prohibits uh, uh, persons resident in India for making remittances towards betting and gambling, right? So this is an express prohibition under the current account transaction rules. So given this kind of an express prohibition, these kind of transactions also cannot be undertaken under the liberalized remittance scheme. Idea being what you can't do directly, you can't do indirectly. What's prohibited in one set of rules and regulations, you cannot do that under a different set of rules and regulations unless it's been specifically provided for in those rules and regulations. Uh, so this is how the broad structure of the liberalized remittance scheme. Then we'll uh, come to uh, you know what is permissible under the liberalized remittance scheme and what is not permissible under the liberalized remittance scheme, right? Um, one of the key things, what is anyway permissible, is that you know uh, you can open a foreign currency bank account, which is a very very big plus, uh, especially for people who are actively looking to you know travel outside India or actively looking to you know invest outside India. So every time they want to remit funds. Um, they don't have to go to the bank and then get the paperwork done and then remit the funds. Instead, they can open a foreign currency bank account. Uh, you know, if you want, uh, you you can remit the entire two hundred fifty thousand dollars in one go, or you can, you know, you can remit uh, funds in bulk and then utilize the funds towards the LRS purposes from your overseas bank account. This is something which has been expressly contemplated under the LRS norms and also specifically permissible under the LRS norms, provided. Uh, the end use, even from your foreign currency bank account, necessarily has to meet the LRS norms. As I said before, what you can't do directly, you are not supposed to do indirectly, right? So that's like a big plus uh, opening of a foreign currency account outside India. Um, the reason why I'm saying it's a big plus is, you know, before the LRS came into place, uh, if you wanted to open a foreign currency bank account, then you specifically needed uh, approval of the RBI, which obviously was, you know, a challenging process and a cumbersome process, unless of course you were an NRI and you had opened a bank account when you were outside India and then continued to do, use that account uh, when you were back in India. Subject to these kind of uh, exceptions, uh, you know, if you had to, if an India if an uh, Indian individual wanted to open a foreign currency bank account, then they necessarily had to take approval of the RBI. But now these are transactions which are specifically permitted under the LRS and obviously under the automatic rule, right? So the next set of permissibility is, you know, purchase of overseas property. Here again, the catch is that the LRS also uh, uh, contemplates a, a clubbing process, wherein, you know, uh, let's say that the property value is $750,000. Uh, then it means that obviously, since your remittance is limited to $250,000, you won't be able to buy the property. Mind you, because uh, you, I'm saying well, you won't be able to buy the property is because you can't apply for a bank loan. Uh, because uh, being an Indian individual, if you want to take an overseas bank loan, that's something which is not permissible under FEMA. It's a capital account transaction, which has not been specifically provided for. Hence, um, individuals in India can't open, uh, can't avail foreign loans, right? So how do you go about buying this particular property? So this is where LRS comes in and specifically contemplates these kind of scenarios and then says that, you know, uh, let's have a clubbing process. A clubbing process is very simple that, you know, uh, me, my wife and my, I don't know, my mother, right? The three of us use each of our uh, respective limits of $250,000. Uh, so put together, uh, the three of us are able to remit $750,000 and uh, we can club all our resources and then uh, purchase the immobile property. Uh, the caveat here is that uh, if you're clubbing your uh, remittances under LRS for a specific action, uh, and if it's a current account, if it's a capital account transaction, like, you know, investment into a particular company or purchase of OCS property, then all the remitters should also be owners of that particular underlying asset. 
let's say if i'm investing into a particular uh, uh, i don't know let's say a foreign brokerage account or something like that then all three of us have to be joint holders of that particular account or in this particular case if uh, we are acquiring um, immobile property together then all three of us also have to be uh, the joint owners of this particular immobile property so that's the caveat while there's a specific permissibility for clubbing again the clubbing comes with a um, um, understanding or the caveat that you know uh, the people who are involved in the clubbing process uh, also need to be the owners of that particular capital asset what else is permissible uh, you can um, uh, undertake donations you can buy art you, uh, you know you can buy gifts or you can or you can buy gifts or you can you know gift your foreign currency under lrs all these are something which is permissible uh, you know you can utilize uh, lrs for your obviously you know uh, leisure travel your business travel uh, your employment related matters immigration related matters or uh, uh, medical expenses or uh, i don't know your kids uh, education uh, overseas all these are something which are permissible under the current account transaction rules they are also permissible under the lrs where things get interesting and complicated are with respect to the investment aspects which i'll touch upon in a while uh, the other most important thing about lrs is that uh, unlike other uh, provisions of fema where you undertake a foreign transaction uh, uh, let's say that you are undertaking uh, Uh, export of goods and then you receive the funds then you have an obligation to get the funds back into india right uh, or you are undertaking any other kind of uh, transaction overseas and then uh, there is some kind of repatriation you can't uh, keep those funds outside india you necessarily have an obligation to bring those funds back into india here where lrs gets very interesting and specifically contemplates a scenario where individuals who are remitting funds under the lrs they don't have an obligation to bring the funds back into india they can retain uh, uh, the funds overseas whether it's the principal amount whether it's the invested amount whether it's any kind of returns on those particular investments your interest income your dividend income arising from your lrs related investments your rental income arising from lrs related investments all these are proceeds of the lrs and there is no obligation to bring it back to india if you bring it back to india that's well and good if you don't want to bring it back to india if you want to keep it parked in your you know a uh, barclays account in the uk or your dbs account in singapore for instance you are more than free to do so right there's absolutely no issue if you want to re reutilize those particular funds again it's not an issue at all let's say that you know uh, you were smart enough or uh, to have purchased you know the shares of apple somewhere in 2013 or 14 and you know it's multiplied five times and now you sell the shares of apple and you know your 200 000, 200000 is now you know a million dollars or 1.2 million dollars there's no obligation on you to bring those funds back into india you can keep it parked in your foreign brokerage account you can keep it parked in your foreign currency bank accounts you can reinvest those funds without any kind of issue whatsoever provided provided that it does not absolve any kind of tax liability i mean this is a point which obviously you know i don't have to explain to chartered accountants uh, uh, you all know schedule fa better than me uh so whatever transactions which you undertake especially investment related transactions whether it's purchase of overseas property opening of bank accounts investing overseas etc you necessarily anyway need to disclose it to the income tax authorities in india so just because you know uh, you're getting uh, uh investment proceeds of any nature uh even if you're keeping it parked in your overseas bank account uh, you should you obviously uh, uh because you continue to stay in india you obviously have an obligation to you know report it report it to the tax authorities here and you know discharge whatever other tax obligations so your discharge of tax obligations you're reporting are completely delinked from your uh, requirement to repatriate the funds back in india you can keep the funds outside india but you can anyway continue to discharge tax in india that's that's something which is expressly contemplated and that's also a legal obligation uh, between the reading of the fema provisions of lrs and the income tax act right uh, what is not permitted under lrs is that uh, credit facilities are not permitted under lrs right so and many times banks ask for a declaration that these are your self owned funds which basically means that you know the indian government uh, has opened this particular lrs channel for you to undertake investments or undertake remittances using your own facilities or your own you know wealth so as to say or assets right so they don't want you to take a loan and then invest it outside india because you know that becomes a systemic issue from from a banking and foreign exchange perspective which is why credit facilities are not permitted for lrs um resident to resident gift is not uh, in foreign currency is not permitted right let's say that uh, i am a resident uh, my wife is a resident uh, you know um, i can't gift to her in foreign currency not neither at the indian level nor and I, ideally i should not be doing this even at the overseas level it shouldn't turn out to be a case where you know 
um, where uh, I remit $250,000 to my bank account. She remits $250,000 to her foreign bank account and later on gives that foreign currency to me. Uh, this happens in practice, but ideally this is not something uh, which should be undertaken because it's not being specifically permitted under the LRS, right? Uh, what is again not permitted under LRS is again remittances to uh, uh, rupee accepting countries like, you know, Bhutan and Nepal, where, you know, you can't purchase foreign exchange for travel to Bhutan or Nepal because you're obligated to uh, utilize Indian rupees. Again, these don't come under the purview of LRS at all because these are rupee transactions. And consequently, if you want to travel to Nepal or if you want to travel to Bhutan, uh, the corollary is that uh, any kind of expenses which you incur in rupees, although it is foreign travel, although it's your leisure travel or business travel as the case may be, they don't get counted towards your LRS limit. So, you know, theoretically speaking, you, you can spend like 10 lakhs or 25 lakhs, you know, travels to Bhutan or Nepal, um, and they won't get covered under your LRS limits. Uh, the next issue which comes about is with respect to, you know, uh, the investment related aspects. When I'm talking about the investment related aspects, I'm specifically talking about investments pertaining to, you know, um, shares, debentures, uh, etc. Right. And here's where things get slightly more uh, complicated because of the changing norms. Uh, what is expressly permitted is, you know, acquisition of shares of listed securities. So, as I said, uh, if I want to buy shares of Apple or if I want to buy, buy shares of Tesla or Google, Netflix, etc., this is something which has been expressly permitted under LRS. If I want to buy um, exchange traded funds on the NASDAQ, if I want to buy any kind of foreign mutual funds, let's say if I want to buy a Vanguard fund or, or if I want to buy, um, uh, I don't know, like a Morgan Stanley index fund or something, that's something which is again expressly permitted under LRS. If I want to invest uh, into a VC fund. Let's say that, you know, I'm a bit of a risk taker and, you know, I want to invest into a uh, tech focused VC fund overseas or, you know, a consumer focused VC fund overseas. Again, I can do so. I can even do so if that tech fund or if that uh, Indian uh, or if that, let's say that the consumer focused fund uh, is going to invest in India. Again, that that won't be considered as a round tripping because, you know, there's a specific cutoff which has been contemplated here and I don't have control uh, as to how these uh, proceeds are getting deployed, which is why um, I can uh, invest in these kind of, you know, tech funds or consumer focused uh, VC funds as well, uh, without any kind of worry uh, relating to round tripping matters as well. Um, if I want to invest in any kind of debt instruments, let's say I want to invest into any kind of secured debentures, or if I want to, you know, buy any kind of uh, treasury bills, etc. Again, these are something which is specifically permitted under LRS. What becomes very uh, difficult and tricky is if I want to invest into unlisted companies, right? And the reason why it becomes uh, complicated uh, when it comes to uh, investments pertaining to unlisted companies is because, you know, there was a sea change in the norms with effect from August 2013. Until 2013 August, the LRS norms were fairly uh, straightforward. It said that, you know, uh, resident individuals can invest in um, companies overseas, both li uh, listed and otherwise. So the use of the word and otherwise obviously gave rise to a fairly straightforward understanding that, you know, Indian companies, in, uh, resident individuals can also invest, you know, in unlisted companies uh, without having to comply with any other norms, because that was something which, you know, was specifically contemplated under the LRS, because it used the words listed companies and otherwise. The only understanding by use of the words otherwise, since it already spoke about listed companies, was that you could also invest in unlisted companies. In 2013, obviously, uh, I mean, as you are anyway well, well aware, the transfer or issue of foreign security regulations of 2004 got substantially amended when it comes to investments by individual. It came about with a specific provision, Regulation 20A, and also incorporated Schedule 5, which essentially said that, look, if Indian individuals are investing overseas in unlisted companies, then they have to follow similar norms as that of uh, Indian companies investing overseas, which basically meant that, you know, you can only invest in a joint venture or a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, you have to go through a reporting process with the RBI. You have to undertake, you know, your filing of your annual performance reports and also comply with like a whole lot of other uh, regulations as such, right? Which made uh, things obviously, you know, a lot more compliance oriented and difficult for uh, 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 individuals who are investing overseas. I mean, prior to 2013, you know, if, even if you wanted to invest in a startup based in the US or a startup based in Israel or Singapore, then you know, all you had to do was go to your authorized dealer bank, um, uh, file your uh, fill in your form A2, and then you know, undertake the remittance, and then you know, 
that would have been the end of the matter but obviously you know after 2013 you have to you know go through the process of going to your authorized dealer bank filing a form odi getting a unique identification number uh, from the authorized dealer bank and of course you know comply with a whole lot of other slightly more you know complicated and cumbersome regulations so this is where the legal position right now is when it comes to investment in listed companies versus investment in unlisted companies uh, investment in listed companies uh, no regulations of uh, any kind no restrictions of any kind investment in unlisted companies again permissible uh, provided you undertake uh, the ardos compliances which has been prescribed under the foreign security regulations right so the bigger issue which comes about and you know it's the source of constant debate for the past few years uh, what happens to uh, investments which uh, indian individuals had undertaken overseas prior to 2013 in unlisted companies right are these kind of investments grandfathered or you know uh, were they in violation of fema or do you have to go to the rbi now to get it regularized i mean uh, it's a regulatory mess uh to say the least because you know there's no one definite answer um rbi has flip flopped on its particular views uh practitioners uh including me um i must confess i'm fairly unclear on what needs to be done in these kind of scenarios right uh because uh one uh legal way of looking at things is that you know since the regulations have a specific cut off date they came into effect only from august 5 2013 which means that Uh, you know whatever transactions happened prior to august 5 2013 uh, you don't need any further compliances uh, with respect to those kind of investments uh, the other extreme view is that look prior to august 2013 uh, since there was no express provision under the foreign security regulations these kind of investments could not have been undertaken at all which is also the view what rbi wants to take but at least my view is that you know it, it doesn't have a sound legal basis considering that the uh lrs regulations it's itself specifically contemplated investment into both listed and unlisted companies so the only way to you know uh take a more harmonized uh, reading of these kind of matters uh, uh is by saying uh you know whatever happened prior to 2013 uh, august are grandfathered and whatever happens after august, august 2013 you have to comply with the revised rpi norms so that's a fair way of looking at it but again uh, i'll be the first one to say that you know uh I, as i term it it's a regulatory mess and there's no clear answer uh, as to what needs to be done uh, if you're one of those people who's undertaking investments uh, in the same startup or same entity prior to 2013 and who wants to continue to do so after 2013 right so what's made the, what's made these compliances uh, complicated um, i mean you it's fairly evident from the uh, slide which i've shared here itself right because first of all it says that you know uh you can only invest in uh, equity or you can only invest in uh, ccps you can't undertake any other kind of uh, uh, uh you can't invest to any other mode you can't provide loan or uh, you can only undertake any kind of uh, uh uh you can only undertake any kind of equity or equity linked exposure which is basically your equity shares and your compulsory convertible preferred shares what is again not permitted is the same restrictions uh, applicable to indian companies you can't engage in real estate business activities overseas you can't engage in banking or financial services activities overseas uh the overseas company has to be engaged in a bona fide business activity you the idea being that you know you should not be uh, investing into shell corporations or shell companies where you you know just parking the funds and you know uh using those funds as an expense account that's something which is not permitted uh the tricky thing uh, uh, uh is that what it specifically says is that you know uh, indian individuals can only invest into operating companies and no step down subsidiaries are permitted again this has been a, a source of great ambiguity uh, what is step down subsidiary i mean is step down subsidiary different from a subsidiary or do you reckon a step down subsidiary from the perspective of the indian of the resident individuals or uh, if you uh, have to reckon uh, Uh, or if you have to reckon uh, uh you know step down subsidiary from the perspective of the overseas company again there's, there's a fair degree of ambiguity and unfortunately the rbi has also not been very forthcoming with you know clarity on this matter these are fairly straightforward points which could have been clarified by the rbi within the regulations itself but uh, whatever to the wisdom of the rbi this is something which they have not undertaken uh the issue gets complicated uh in fairly uh, simple scenarios let's talk about a scenario where you know uh i have invested uh, 15% into a us company uh, obviously you know uh, 
uh, I'm not in majority control of, the, of this particular company. I'm not even in board control of this particular company. And tomorrow, if the US company uh, passes a board resolution or a shareholders resolution saying that, look, they want to uh, incorporate a step down subsidiary or they want to incorporate a subsidiary in London, which subsidiary in turn uh, is going to set up another subsidiary in Paris, am I in violation of the ODA regulations, right? Going by the plain reading, yes, I would be in violation of the ODA regulations because it says that, look, I can only invest in an operating company. But uh, where matters have been taken without my consent or where ma matters have been uh, taken in such a manner that even my say would not have had any bearing by virtue of my 15% shareholding, um, even though uh, I was not involved in the process or even though you know I voted against that particular process, nonetheless, the overseas company has gone ahead and undertaken that action and... Uh, I continue to be in violation. I mean, this is a very practical scenario which has been uh, panning out uh, across multiple uh, uh, companies as well, uh, especially where you know the resident individual is in a minority shareholding. But going by a plain reading of these particular regulations, you are held to be in default by virtue of uh, your overseas investing company setting up subsidiaries, right? So this is where RBA needs to bring about further clarity and uh, talk about these kind of uh, you know, remove these kind of uh, restrictions, which obviously, you know, have uh, no business relevance of any sort. You know, having these kind of restrictions in a place where, you know, the resident individual is the majority shareholder, it may not make business sense, at least it may make legal sense and practical sense, but uh, to put this kind of a restriction in a scenario where the Indian shareholder may not even be in majority control, uh, and then expect the Indian shareholders to still ensure compliance uh, by the overseas company, um, that's a tad difficult and challenging uh, for, you know, logical reasons, as you can imagine. What are the other compliances? You know, the other compliances are fairly straightforward, you know. Uh, they're pretty much akin to Indian companies investing overseas, which means that, you know, you need to have a valuation certificate. You need to ensure that the share certificates are filed with the RBI. Uh, you need to file your annual performance report. Uh, you need to file audited accounts. Any kind of change in shareholding pattern or disinvestments needs to be reported uh, to the RBI. Uh, it also says that you know no write-off is permitted. Again, it's not very logical. Let's say I've invested in a startup overseas and then startup is tanked within a period of six months or eight months. Um, I don't know what to do then. I right? I mean, in which case, you know, I have to go to the RBI. Tell the RBI that look, my cost of investment is now um, reduced by 80% or 90% or it's a complete write-off. Uh, kindly give me permission to close this. Again, it doesn't make any kind of logical sense uh, considering that you know uh, these kind of transactions do happen practically. But again, uh, this is where things become more compliant-oriented and challenging and also cumbersome. I mean, if I put in $10,000 in a startup and I mean that startup has lost money and you know it's going to shut down in a period of, you know, six to eight months. Now I have to go to the RBI to, uh, you know, uh, apply to the RBI and tell them that, look, justify the reasons why this startup did not perform well and justify as to why I lost my own, you know, $10,000, right? So it's a difficult process and, you know, uh, becomes more compliance oriented and also adds to the uh, cost, cost of undertaking these kind of investments. Uh, the other thing is that unlike LRS, where if you're investing in an overseas startup uh, or an, uh, undertaking investment in any kind of overseas unlisted companies, uh, mind you, in, in case of listed companies, I said that, you know, there's no obligation on you to bring the uh, uh, reinvestment proceeds. Uh, you, you can reinvest the proceeds and, you know, whatever are the returns on your investments, you can retain them outside India. For instance, the dividend you receive from your Apple shares or from your Google shares, you can receive them outside India. But in the case of unlisted companies, you necessarily need to bring those funds back into India within a period of 60 days. Again, these norms are identical to the compliances and the obligations placed on Indian companies. The same kind of obligations have been placed on uh, the Indian individual as well. Uh, someone had uh, put forth a question as to what will be a joint venture or a wholly owned subsidiary. Again, if you look at the definition of a wholly owned subsidiary, it means that you know uh, the Indian individual should be holding 100% of the share capital of the overseas company. Um, what is a joint venture? Uh, a joint venture, going by co common parlance understanding, necessitates that you know you should have a joint venture agreement or an understanding in place. But for PEMA purposes, anything which is not a uh, wholly owned subsidiary automatically falls within the bucket of a joint venture. The RBI has been clear about these provisions from day one itself. 
and even for the case of individuals let's say that you are only holding 5% shares of a us company 5% shares of a singapore company or let's even talk about an extreme scenario where you are only holding you know 0.5% shares or 1% shares nonetheless it will be treated as a joint venture whether or not you have any kind of underlying joint venture understanding you need to comply with form odi you need to go through all these difficult compliances uh, irrespective of your percentage stake in the overseas unlisted company so that covers uh, you know a various uh, bunch of uh, investments which are permitted uh, by resident individuals under the lrs norms and under the uh, you know regulation 20a right which schedule 5 of the foreign secondary regulations uh, what are other modes by which uh, 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 individuals can acquire foreign securities uh, these days it's become a very favorite mode for you know startups to incorporate company outside india so they go through what is known as a gift of securities because you know there's a particular regulation which contemplates gifting of securities by a person resident outside india so instead of startups uh, you know who want to have a flip structure and you know who want to uh, incorporate a us company and raise funds in the us and then invest those funds into an indian wholly owned subsidiary rather than setting up uh, uh, a wholly owned subsidiary rather than remitting funds from uh, india because you know if you want to remit funds into an unlisted company as i said you need to go through the form odi process so this is a short circuit process you know i mean practical i don't vouch for it uh, but you know this is how things are happening in practice is that you know you get a friend or a relative to uh, set up a us company for you uh, and you know what about 100 dollars or 200 dollars and that uh, us individual then uh, you know uh, gives the securities to you so that way you know you are acquiring foreign securities uh bypassing the form odi process and regulation 20 of the foreign security regulation personally i don't recommend this because you know this is the kind of structure or this is the kind of issue which is is going to come into the rbi radar sooner or later but this is one uh, favorite practical scenario in which you know uh, people are utilizing this uh, provision of gift of securities from a person is in outside india uh the other mode from which you can obviously you know acquire foreign securities is inheritance you know if you have a family member who's uh uh whether in, in india or outside india who's you know uh, deceased and who you know uh, you have to acquire shares by way of foreign uh, by inheritance then obviously you know this is a transmission under law and there's no kind of bar of any nature in you acquiring these kind of foreign securities uh the common mode especially uh, for all of you you know who dealt with uh, subsidiaries of uh, us companies or subsidiaries of uh, overseas listed companies then you know that the indian individuals here the indian employees and the indian directors become eligible for esops so esops are another mode uh, which has been expressly contemplated under the foreign security regulations by which uh, in individuals in india indian employees and indian directors of a subsidiary company can receive uh, shares of a uh, foreign listed uh, oh okay whatever foreign listed or unlisted company because you know esop is a specific channel it's a very practical channel and it's a useful channel uh so which is by you know issuance of esops and acquiring foreign securities under esops have been expressly contemplated under the foreign security regulations again here the catch here is that uh you know uh you are vested with the esops you get the shares and in due course you sell the shares uh this is not an lrs channel because this is a separate channel which is been expressly contemplated under, under regulation 22 of the foreign security regulation so the lrs benefits don't apply here which basically means that you know uh you are an uh, employee of ibm or you are an employee of uh, cisco you sell the shares of cisco or ibm overseas uh, you can't retain these funds in your overseas bank account or in your overseas brokerage account you have to bring these funds back into india so the benefit of lrs which uh, uh, allows you to uh, retain and reinvest uh, investment proceeds outside india that benefit is not applicable especially when it comes to transactions under the esop route here you necessarily have to bring the funds immediately and in any case within a period of 90 days of the sale uh i see there are a few questions on uh, uh lrs aspects i can take up those questions right now and then you know uh move to the deposit regulations if that's fine by you all uh carpal whatever is convenient to you 
we generally take up questions at the end but if you comfortable taking it right away no issues um i can take it up right away because you know we reached uh, uh, we've covered a fair number of uh, time on this particular topic so i think i can just cover uh, each of this right now and then we can move on to the next part of the session then no, then no, no, no. okay uh, so the first is question, the questions okay. yeah sorry yeah sorry. you can access the questions godam you can see the questions i can access the questions yes i can yeah. uh, read out the question i can everyone see the questions no no okay i'll read out the first question first question yeah. is indian party making investment in company outside india by acquiring 1% of shares having voting rights is it comes under the odi investment or portfolio investment uh, unfortunately it doesn't come under portfolio investment because you know uh, whenever rbi has been talking about portfolio investment they have been talking about portfolio investment their idea of portfolio investment is investment in listed companies investment in uh, mutual funds overseas Uh, anything else is not considered to be a portfolio investment investment in uh, venture capital funds is a different bucket altogether and that's been explicitly uh, contemplated but now especially after the revised norms which have come about since august 2013 uh, if you are the moment you are investing in an unlisted company as i said whether it doesn't matter whether you are acquiring a 0.5% stake or a 1% stake uh, it will not be treated as an uh, uh, portfolio investment and it will come under the odi norms i mean i mean i don't agree with this particular view at all because you know uh, this is not how what constitutes a joint venture especially when in a scenario of uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, investments by individuals so the rbi should have given a, a higher threshold of you know a 5% stake or 10% stake below which these kind of regulations would not kick in but unfortunately given that this has not been the case and you know the rbi has used a same uh, definition and scope as applicable to indian companies which is the broad based definition of what constitutes a joint venture so even a 1% stake uh, would necessarily be construed as a joint venture by the rbi whether or not it is joint venture at a de facto level and you will need to comply with the odi norms which also addresses the next query which is what is portfolio investment for odi odi purposes any kind of investment in listed securities is considered as portfolio investment it, this this could be listed uh, uh, equity securities or it could be listed de debt securities uh, the moment you are investing into any kind of listed securities then you are safe and clear because these are considered as portfolio investments can an uh, an indian person invest in a foreign company uh, which has subsidiaries in india uh here again uh, it becomes very tricky because you know as i was talking about this an express bar that you know uh, individuals can only invest in operating companies and no step down subsidiaries are permitted again if you are looking at it from a perspective of uh, the indian individual uh, then uh, the uh, subsidiary company of the foreign company will become a step down subsidiary or a step down entity Uh, which is not contemplated under the uh, schedule 5 of the foreign security regulations but some people are taking a view that you know step down subsidiary has to be reckoned from the perspective of the foreign company in which case it will just be a subsidiary and not a step down subsidiary but again the moment you bring the the moment it becomes uh, having an indian connection uh, you know there's an rbi faq which treats these kind of transactions as round tripping uh, so while many a scenario many a time this happens or uh, um, with, with the investor knowing or many times without the investor knowing especially where the indian investor is in a minority uh, it's preferably not advised to you know undertake these kind of transactions practically obviously it makes a whole lot of sense but legally and rbi has started taking a lo lot more stricter view of these kind of transactions especially in the last couple of years uh, which you know as many of you know especially from the kind of compounding orders which has been passed by the rbi so these kind of transactions you know while they do happen uh it's not advisable that's how i would look at it valuation report of a foreign company is required from a ca or cpa in case of an odi uh is it means that indian ca can give the valuation report yes i mean in in this particular case an indian ca can give the valuation report of a foreign company as well uh um, this is something uh, which is expressly permitted and i mean i myself have you know handled matters where you know we've taken a uh, valuation report from an indian chartered accountant so here again uh, this is something which has been expressly permitted uh, and recognized by both the authorized dealer bank and the rbi uh, and there's no uh, ambiguity that an indian chartered accountant uh, can provide the valuation report of a foreign company
So next part of the session, uh, you know, uh, just look at my notes. So the next part of my session, I want to uh, deal with the deposit regulations. Um, uh, confession, I'm really not an expert on the deposit regulations, but I'll try to do justice on, you know, what is the broad scope of uh, the deposit regulations under FEMA and uh, what is permitted and what is not permitted. Um, so uh, the idea of having uh, deposit regulations is essentially to uh, permit inflow of foreign exchange into the country by the Indian diaspora. This is the broad theme by which uh, there have been a de deposit regulations. The earlier deposit regulations were when FEMA was, uh, you know, enacted back in 2000. Uh, now it's been replaced by the FEMA deposit regulations of 2015. You know, it essentially, I mean, if any of you have walked into a bank branch, maybe not so in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months, but before, you know, they would, they would put up all these notices about, you know, NRE account will give you such kind of interest, uh, NRO account will give you these kind of interest uh, and all that. So who are they talking about and what is the purpose? This is something which falls within the ages of the uh, deposit regulations. Uh, uh, the deposit regulations basically talks, talks about different kinds of bank accounts which can be opened by um, persons resident outside India with an authorized dealer bank or any other kind of uh, scheduled or commercial bank in India. So that's the broad uh, purpose of having the uh, deposit regulations. So the most common uh, accounts which are opened under the deposit regulations are your non-resident uh, external uh, account, which is your NRE account and the non-resident ordinary account, which is your NRO account. Both of them are rupee accounts. The key difference being is that, you know, NRE account uh, is provides for free repatriation. NRO account also permits for repatriation, but on what is known as a non-repatriation basis. Non-repatriation basis doesn't mean that you can't take the money out at all. It means that you can take the money out subject to certain terms and conditions. Obviously, you know, uh, the banks are also fairly smart about this. The kind of interest which you earn on an NRE account is far lower than the kind of interest which you earn on an NRO account. Uh, but the, uh, the reason why many people still continue to have both NRE and NRO accounts is, you know, uh, one is obviously, you know, it gives you a whole lot of flexibility. Uh, getting 3% return on your uh, NRE bank account in India is obviously, you know, much better than, you know, uh, having a zero interest bank account somewhere in the UK. But again, this also, you're also taking the foreign exchange risk. So you have to think five times before, you know, you open a NRE bank account in India. But where, you know, you're talking about a scenario where the dollar is appreciating, etc., then, you know, many times opening of these kind of bank accounts uh, work to your benefit. So when I'm talking about the bank accounts, I'll, be, I'll primarily be dealing with the NRE bank account and the NRO bank account. There's also something called as a, a FCNR bank account, foreign currency non-resident bank account, which means that this is a dollar designated bank account, which also can be opened by a uh, person's resident outside India. Again, this is a fully repatriable account, which means that, uh, you know, you don't have to justify why you're taking the money out of India. You want to close the account or you want to withdraw $1,000 or a uh, rupee equivalent of $1,000 from your FCNR account or from your NRE account, you don't have to justify to anyone and you're free to take this uh, money back, right? So that's the purpose, that, that's how a repatriation bank account works. Um, so what is a permissible credit and a permissible debit under uh, the NRE bank accounts and the NRO bank accounts? Uh, I'll first deal with the NRE bank account, uh, then I'll come to the NRO bank account because the NRO bank account also has a couple of more, you know, uh, nuances, uh, if I may put it that way. Uh, as I said, an NRE bank account is a fully repatriable bank account, which, be, which means that basically I can do whatever I want with this particular bank account. Uh, uh, and you know, I can take the money out whenever I want without having any kind of issues of any nature. Which means that, you know, if I want to invest using my NRE bank account into India, if I want to buy any kind of immovable property, uh, I can do so. If I want to invest in Indian companies, I can do so. If I want to undertake any kind of local payments, uh, this is again something which is specifically contemplated under the NRE bank account. There's no particular issue. NRE bank account can be opened by NRIs and by PIOs. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about uh, NRIs are obviously, you know, uh, Indian uh, Indian passport holders who are staying overseas. Um, FEMA, in most other cases, talks about OCIs, which means that, you know, uh, they are people who are holding a foreign passport but have an OCI card with them issued under the Citizenship Act of 1956. 
uh, but whereas PIOs are people, persons of Indian origin. So let's say that, you know, uh, I am a British citizen. I don't have an OCI card, uh, but, you know, my parents or my grandparents were Indian, then I'll be considered as a person of Indian origin. Uh, NRE accounts need not be opened only by OCIs. They can also be opened by PIOs, which basically means that I don't need to have an OCI card to open an NRE bank account in India uh, because the deposit regulations have not been modified to bring it in sync with other regulations under FEMA, which specifically talks about only NRIs or OCIs. For instance, your uh, FDA regulations now doesn't recognize PIOs at all. It only talks about NRIs or uh, OCIs. But here we are talking about a scenario where funds are coming into India. So, you know, if there's scope for uh, getting more funds into India, then doesn't matter as long as you're a person of Indian origin, whether you hold an OCA card or otherwise, you are permitted to invest into uh, India and open up an NRE account. Uh, uh, coming back to the issue, what I was talking about is, you know, you can, as I said, you also, you can also invest into India. Uh, you can undertake uh, investment in listed securities. You can, uh, you can do any kind of unlisted investments in India um, through your NRE account. But because this is uh, a fully repatriable account, it is akin to a foreign currency account, which basically means that if I'm investing from my NRE account, then this will be treated as an FDI transaction, which means that, you know, I have to comply with the RBA norms of reporting. Uh, I have to, the Indian company will have to file FCGPR, will have to recognize the person uh, as a foreign shareholder. So this is a very, very key distinction between NRE accounts and NRO accounts because of the fully repatriable nature of the NRE bank accounts any kind of investments made uh, into Indian companies through the NRE bank account will be akin to a foreign direct investment, which means that all your sectoral norms and compliances will be applicable. Uh, the compliances pertaining to form FCGPR will be applicable and you need to undertake all kinds of other RBI related uh, activities as well, including compliance with pricing norms, etc. Because as I said, because it will be treated as a foreign investment, these kind of compliances will come into play if you are investing through an NRE bank account uh, into an Indian company. So this is what can be, uh, uh, these, these are the broad list of, you know, permissible debits into the NRE bank account, which as I said, you know, you can take money out from your NRE account uh, back to your parent account somewhere in the US or in Singapore, that's a permissible debit. Your uh, discharge of local payments in India and you know utilizing for your uh, expenses in India, that is a permissible debit. Uh, you can transfer to other NRE accounts because both accounts are you know repatriable in nature. Uh, investment, as I said, is something which is uh, specifically permissible. What are the kind of permissible credits? Uh, Let's say that I have invested into a foreign, into an Indian company using my NRE account, and uh, you know tomorrow I sell the shares. Uh, the money comes back into my NRE account here again uh, because you know this is a fully repatriable account. Uh, you know the money will necessarily come back into my NRE account, and from here you know if I want to take the money out, then this is something which is perfectly fine. Coming to the NRO account, NRO account, as I said, is uh, considered to be a non-repatriation account, uh, which also means that you get a lot more flexibility when you're dealing with uh, NRO accounts. Uh, NRO accounts can be opened by any person resident outside India. So you need not even be an Indian person or a, a Indian citizen or you know an OCI or a person of Indian origin. Let's say that uh, you are a US citizen and you want to open an NRO bank account in India, you can do so. Theoretically speaking, but Indian banks, obviously, because of KYC issues and other issues, they normally don't permit you to do that. Um, foreign trusts, uh, which are uh, held by uh, Indian individuals or which are held by NRIs or OCIs, they can also open uh, NRO bank accounts in India. Uh, so it's not restricted to NRIs or PIO similar to, uh, uh, similar to your uh, NRE bank accounts. The scope of who can open an NRO, NRO bank account is obviously, you know, much wider compared to that of uh, NRE bank account. This is a purely uh, rupee account. Uh, what NRE NRO account permits you to do is that, you know, NRO, NRO account is uh, almost akin to a 
domestic rupio account you know held by you and i which basically means that it gives you the widest degree of flexibility to undertake transactions in india so any and uh, any and every transaction which you and i can undertake that can also be undertaken by an nro account holder which means that you know uh, they can undertake any kind of local payments any kind of local expenses uh, any kind of dues in india you know uh, i am paying the rent for my i being an nri and paying the rent for my parents house in india this is something which i can discharge using my nro bank account so because these will all be considered as legitimate dues in india of the nro account holder so or if i have to pay indian taxes uh, for whatever reason then you know i can discharge that using my nro bank account it gives me the widest degree of flexibility i want to acquire property in india i can do so you know i want to gift uh, uh my uh, funds in my rupee account uh, to a relative in india that's something which i can do under the nro account again uh investment into nro investment through an nro account has been specifically uh, recognized under the uh, fdi rules as well which is your non debt instrument rules which is talking about schedule 4 investment on a non repatriation basis so if i if i who's an nri i'm going to invest into an indian company using my nro account then the Uh, non uh, non debt in, uh, instrument rules specifically schedule for specifically treats these kind of investments as akin to a domestic investment which means that uh, because it's it it will be treated as a domestic investment i don't need to take any kind of rbi approvals i don't need to take any kind of rbi compliances if the in, uh, nri is investing through this uh, schedule for route which is considered to uh, an investment on a non repatriation basis uh it means that because it's getting treated as uh, similar to a domestic investment even your fcgpr and any other rbi compliances will not be applicable for these kind of investments so that's the advantage of investing uh, through an nro account uh, which also gives you a whole lot of sectoral issues and uh, compliances and conditionalities need not be adhered to and the indian company which is also receiving the receiving the funds from an nri or uh, or an oci through their nro bank account uh it doesn't have to undertake any of these rbi related compliances so these are the permissible debits to an nro uh, account uh, so let's talk about the next uh, scenario in, in an nro account right i have invested into an indian company using my nro account you know uh, i get the proceeds back into my nro account because it's investment on a non repatriation basis what does this mean what happens in this kind of scenario as i said non repatriation basis doesn't mean that you can't take the money out at all it means that you can take the money out subject to certain conditions the first condition obviously you know i don't have to tell this to chartered accountants you have to discharge your taxes right subject to your discharge of taxes you can take up to 1 million dollar per financial year under a different set of regulations under fema which is your remittance of asset regulation which specifically contemplates nris or pios uh, to take up to 1 million dollar per financial year outside india from proceeds in their nro account or proceeds from any kind of sale of any kind of assets uh, any kind of inheritance or legacy related matters uh, if funds are coming accruing into your nro account which basically means that you know you can take up to 1 million dollar per financial year uh, from your nro bank account let's say that you know you invested uh, many years back in a new mobile property for you know 5 crores and to, today you are selling it for you know 30 crores which is you know roughly about 4 million dollars uh, it means that you know once that 4 million dollars comes into your nro bank account subject to payment of taxes you can't take the entire uh, 30 crores in one go which you could have done so from your nre bank account because it's a fully repatriation account uh, but in your nro bank account you have to take it uh, over a period of time subject to the overall cap of 1 million dollar per financial year which means that you you will require about 4 years time to take the money out from your nro bank uh what is permitted uh, to be taken out is current income from your nro bank account and the general understanding is that because taking out of current account a uh, current income is not a remittance of asset so which is why uh, current account uh, current in take repatriation of current income won't fall within this 1 million dollar limit which means that you know if you have current income such as you know uh, uh interest which you are accruing from your nro account or you know dividends for instance from uh, uh, any of your investments and all that these you can take out on day one itself and these don't get subject to the 1 million dollar restriction again there's some degree of ambiguity here but this is a fairly comfortable view which uh, you can take 
uh, when it comes to uh, remittances from your non repatriation account, which is your NR account. Uh, there are a few queries here as well with respect to uh, you know uh, NRO accounts as well. Uh, the first query is where from I can invest? Is it NRE or NRO account without filing FCGPR? As I said, uh, the NRO account uh, is the non-repatriation account, which is also what is contemplated under you know Schedule Four of your non-debt instrument rules. So if you if you don't want to file FCGPR and go through the RBI compliances, then you have to invest through your NRO account because the moment you invest through your NRE account, it's akin to a foreign investment and you have to comply with your FCGPR reportings. Uh, then the same question has been asked by someone else, which also I've addressed. Can a foreign citizen make investment in Indian company from an NRO account? Is it coming under FDI? Uh, provided you have, uh, you are an NRI or you have an OCI, assuming that the foreign citizen is an OCI, only then they can undertake investment into Indian companies because that's the only way you read a combination of your deposit regulations with your non debt instrument rules, uh, which is your schedule four and the non debt instrument rules. Uh, if I'm a foreign citizen, uh, if I'm not an NRI or if I'm not an OCI, obviously, sorry, not an NRI, if I'm not an OCI, then I can't undertake investments from my NRO account at all because that's not something which is contemplated under the non debt instrument rules. So the only way uh, the foreign citizen can invest is to, uh, to take the money out from the NRO account and then use his or her foreign bank account to invest into India under the FDA norms. A uh, couple of other queries uh, pertaining back to the uh, LRS and the foreign security regulations. Uh, in case of ESOP from foreign company to employees of Indian subsidiary company, how the reporting should be made by the Indian employees? Uh, the reporting is not made by the Indian employees. There is the reporting is has to be made by the Indian company itself on behalf of the employees. For instance, if uh, IBM US has issued ESOPs to uh, uh, employees of IBM India, and uh, for exercise of those ESOPs, uh, the uh, IBM India employees have to remit you know ten dollars each or hundred dollars each. Then the reporting should is not being done by each of those individuals because it's an aggregate reporting. So the onus uh, to report is on IBM India, not on the individual employees. In case there's no remittance from India, if it's a cashless uh, ESOP, then obviously the question of reporting does not arise. Uh, the next query is, Indian company has availed professional services from a person resident of USA who's one of the shareholder of the same company uh, can the company make remittances for professional services to his NRO account maintained in India? Uh, if he's a, re a resident outside India, then and if the services have come from the US, then ideally, uh, because uh, this is an import of uh, services, you know, you are better off making remittances in foreign exchange to the person resident outside. Uh, this brings me to the end of my session. I mean, uh, I know the time allotted was uh, till seven o'clock, but you know, I think I have wrapped up my share of uh, the session uh, uh, in an hour time. Uh, there are some questions in the chat box, actually. In fact, I had one question at the start and there are, there are two questions. Okay, I'm looking at the, uh, sorry. Okay, let me stop the screen share and go to that. Sure, 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 sure. Can you see the chat box? Okay. So, okay. So I was looking at the queries on the Q and A tab. Uh, yes. Let me open up the chat box as well. Sure. <clears throat> okay. First query is, um, can you give an example of clubbing and its permissibility only where the family members are co-owners? Uh, the ideal, uh, the most common example is acquisition of immobile property. As I said, if you want to uh, buy an apartment in Singapore and it's costing, you know, $750,000, uh, then you invest with your family members and all three of you become the joint owners of that particular property. So clubbing is only permitted for capital account transactions. If you want to do any kind of current account transaction, then it's an each to your own kind of scenario. And you know, uh, the foreign currency accounts are not uh, fungible in nature to that particular extent. 
or you know if you and your wife want to open a joint brokerage account and if you want to invest in listed company overseas because investment in listed securities is also a capital account transaction uh, you can club your uh, foreign currency accounts or you can club your remittances provided both you and your wife or also become the joint holders of that foreign brokerage account can proceeds of esop bought when invested in nr uh need to be repatriated within 90 days in line with the cashless esop uh see if you are acquired foreign security when you are a person resident outside india uh it goes back to uh section 6 bracket 4 of fema uh you know you can continue to hold that particular security even after you become a resident uh there is no obligation to repatriate those funds back into india uh person is a canadian citizen but tio he wants to set up a trust in india he wants to contribute 5 lakhs as initial contribution uh trust not having uh uh fcra can he transfer the funds to his nre to nro account and donate to the trust if you want to uh uh this is more of an fcra query uh and there's a very big problem with fcra because uh fema recognizes the concept of residency uh fcra contemplates only citizenship if you are a foreign citizen uh whether or not you are investing through your nre account your foreign bank accounts or through your your indian bank account you will necessarily get hit by fcra because fcra the moment you are a foreign citizen even if you are an oci card holder it doesn't matter any kind of contribution any kind of remittances uh Uh, from a foreign citizen will get covered under the fcra so even if you are a canadian citizen here but you are a pio you should not be undertaking this kind of remittance either from your uh, uh nre bank account or from your even from your nro bank account related question can a foreign citizen be an author and managing trustee you can be a trustee that's really not an issue uh but as i said you can't because you're not in a position to contribute to the trust uh you can't be the author of this particular trust can an nri give a loan to his relative in india by remitting funds into his uh nre or nro account uh i'm presuming that we are talking about a scenario where you know the nri is utilizing his nre or nro account and remitting funds to the relative into the savings account uh, yes i mean if you want to give a short term loan yes that's something which you can do through your uh, nro bank accounts uh gadam there uh, wouldn't uh, uh, it trigger uh, the point that uh, uh, it's a foreign currency loan nothing of that kind no worries uh, if you are giving it to your immediate relative relative as yes. under the companies act then there is then there's no issue uh, if you're giving it to a uh, wider relative uh, sister say my sister If you want to give funds to your particular sister, then there is really not an issue at all. Uh, yes, there's no issue if you're giving it to any media. But if I have to give it to you, then that would trigger. Uh... Correct, right? Then that then that becomes uh, falls within the, uh, the ambit of you know external commercial borrowings, and then you know the Indian individual will then have like a whole lot of issues. Understood. Understood. does a savings bank account automatically convert into an nro account when the resident holder becomes nr it should be formally intimated to the bank it it uh, and vice versa as well because the onus is on you the moment you go outside india and you become a non resident then you have to intimate your bank to convert it into an nro bank account and vice versa once you come back into india then you have to reconvert this particular bank account into a resident account what happens when the nr who has established the nr account becomes uh, yes similar thing right uh, your nre account uh, let's say that you are a person resident out uh, for a nr account obviously because you know it's a rupee account it's a savings account uh, there isn't much issue at all you know conversion process from a resident to an nr account or from a nr account to a resident account is a fairly straightforward process uh, banks are very easy going when it comes to these kind of compliances so it really isn't an issue with an nre account it becomes so much more difficult uh, you know you can continue to hold and operate your nre accounts uh, even after you become a resident uh, but you can't put further funds into your nre account that's the difficult part 
what are the benefits of a, a special non resident rupee account uh, nrsr account are they popular in usage they are not very popular in usage because you know uh, they provide a whole lot of you know uh, banks routinely uh, report these kind of special non resident rupee accounts to the rbi uh, the restriction is that you know you are supposed to be a person resident outside india but you are utilizing these funds for your business expenses in india so it falls within a very narrow framework uh, so it's mostly used by you know uh, uh, let me talk about you know foreign portfolio investors right who have an immediate need to open these kind of bank accounts you know so that you know uh, if they are investing into debt securities in india you know they need a whole lot of uh, back and forth movement into these kind of bank accounts uh, so they are the kind of people who would typically use these kind of uh, accounts or you know uh, people uh, who have other kind of you know business transactions where you require any kind of business move very very require any kind of cash movements uh, uh, on a very short term basis and for an immediate basis you know opening of these kind of uh, special non resident rupee account become beneficial but otherwise it's not beneficial at all because whatever you can do under your uh, special non resident rupee accounts you can very well do so under your nri account and your nro account without the added scrutiny of both your authorized dealer bank and your rbi because rbi closely monitors the activities that happen in a special non resident rupee account which is the reason why barring uh, select businesses outside india which have a pressing need to open these kind of bank accounts otherwise they are not popular in usage at all uh can i open bank account outside india to receive some sort of account of a will legacy bequest uh because this is not an lrs channel at all uh yes, yes, sir. bank account outside india uh, and if you receive uh, let's say you know you have a generous uncle who's donating uh, hundreds of dollars to you uh, exactly you have, you have to bring those funds back into india okay uh, because this is something which is because this is not an lrs channel you as a person resident in india uh if you receive any kind of foreign securities you can continue to hold so because you know there's a specific permissibility um uh, if you receive any kind of foreign assets uh through inheritance uh, you can continue to hold so the but the moment you get a uh, foreign uh, uh currency uh again subject to correction correction i don't have a definitive answer etc uh but my idea would be that you know you get hit by a uh, surrender or a uh, retention of foreign exchange uh, regulations which contemplates that you know in all other kind of scenarios where there is any kind of foreign exchange being received you have an obligation to bring those funds back into india within a period of 90 days so at least when it comes to you know okay. foreign currency it's always prudent to bring those funds back into india uh, but if you have inherited foreign securities or foreign assets you can continue to hold so uh what about las vegas gambling or casino winnings i mean i'll say you are a very lucky we had a question like this uh, gotham sometime back uh, yes. but this is not a permitted capital current current account transaction exactly. at all so you yeah. should not be undertaking these kind of transactions it's similar to your bitcoin or cryptocurrency scenario right because mm-hmm. rbi specifically said that you know uh, this is not a permitted tr- uh, uh, current account transaction or permitted capital account transaction there are a lot of indian software professionals um who receive who don't who don't want to receive uh, uh funds uh in rupees or in dollars they'll say that look let me take 50% currency 50% in cash and 50% in the form of cryptocurrencies you you can continue to hold those cryptocurrency but the moment you sell those uh you are obligated to bring bring those back into india and then you are falling under the income tax radar i mean you will know about it more from an income tax perspective but from a yes. perspective because this is not permitted at all or uh, the moment you undertake these kind of transactions you are in violation of fema and obviously you know uh, the moment you come under the income tax scrutiny this is the kind of cases which will flow from the uh, income tax authorities to the rbi authorities or to the Info- enforcement directorate authorities okay so uh, he has to simply give it to gift it to somebody in 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 the in the us who can then gift it to me or something like that some some work around we would have to do but then it is stamped yes. with uh, with the taint of a uh, illegal activity 
or you know the age old saying is that the house always wins or you keep playing until you lose yeah. <laughs> ஒரு <laughs> uh uh which which we can share with our client so for example uh las vegas ga- gambling winnings what i would tell is boss if you're going to say the us and you you have plans of going to uh, las vegas if you win anything there is no direct way of getting it into india that is something which i will tell them but otherwise uh, uh, as practitioners uh, when we get some some odd kind of questions how should our response be to to our clients see the main thing uh, one of the things these days is you know especially because you know information uh interchange between governments has become so much more significant right it was not the case you know 10 years back now you have you know your common reporting standards and you have other uh, information exchange uh, agreements which have been entered into between the countries so your the first thing which i always tell clients and you know as chartered accountants you know the, you also have an obligation uh, is whatever are the kind of foreign exchange transactions you have to ensure that that gets reported to indian tax authorities you know because otherwise this is the kind of issues which uh, rbi or your income tax authorities will start uh, looking at it from you know a black money perspective and all that so the repercussions become far more uh, serious so many times you know people take these kind of things pretty casually and you know they say okay you know i had invested something you know many years back but you know i had forgotten about it or you know i've just been sitting about it the question which you know you have to many times you know probably actively get it out of your clients is that you know whether you have undertaken any kind of these kind of investments whether you have undertaken any kind of you know foreign exchange transactions you have foreign bank accounts etc please report it uh, under your uh, income tax norms because then you know then at least you have credible defense tomorrow if there are any kind of issues then at least you are able to take a bona fide defense that look it uh, you are able to take a defense that look it was a bona fide error but look on the other hand i have already reported this to the income tax authorities so even if there is a uh, foreign exchange issue with the rbi i am in a position to take a credible defense to say that look these are reported transactions uh, reported uh, to my authorized dealer bank reported to the income tax authorities so give me the degree of leeway so that's you know becomes essential when it comes to uh dealing with your nro account as i said right nro account gives you a whole degree of flexibility on what you can do with your nro bank accounts uh so there aren't too many issues revolving around nro bank accounts as such uh got a one last uh, uh, uh input uh, before we part uh, so for example when we deal in lrs and uh, nro accounts the 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 engagement with the bankers is fairly intense so for example i go to the banker and say i need to i need to send out uh, Say around three hundred thousand dollars for my uh, uh, son's education in the US, and and the payment goes through, all right? Although the limit and the cap is two fifty thousand dollars, the payments happened. The the bankers may be not aware, God knows what happened, uh, right. but the payment went through. And then uh, now, uh, uh, when we file our uh, income tax returns, or uh, this get picked, uh, this gets picked up for whatever reason by the tax authorities, uh, we are stumped uh, when we see. that the uh, remittance has happened in violation of the regulations despite the authorized dealer banker being in the in the picture correct so right. from a our standpoint uh, 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 how would we go about it is compounding the only option um do we have to hold our hands before the uh, regional uh, office yeah compounding is literally the only option and the thing is you know when it comes to these kind of lrs related transactions especially pertaining to current account transactions like in this particular case of you know medical expenses of your or your you know kids uh, education yeah. expenses and all that rbi yes. also takes a fairly lenient view when it comes to current yes. account right yes. i mean let's say that you know or you're doing some kind of group travel within you and your family and you know you decide to have like a luxurious travel and you know you or you you're doing multiple travels and you know you exceed that 250000 dollar limit that's not the end of the world even if you want to go and get it compounded and then you know uh, you don't want to uh you know face any kind of rbi brunt five years down the line and you have to do it today itself you are always better off going to the rbi and telling them that look it was an inadvertent contravention the good thing is when it comes to these kind of current account transaction rbi also 
takes a fairly practical view and lets you off with a very lenient penalty. But that's not the case when it comes to capital account transaction. You can't say that look, okay, you know, I was investing in 